Right, for the next couple of weeks, before we get into Advent, that's the Christmas season, we're uh, going to look, I thought, at some parables of Jesus. So, there are a special set of stories in the Bible that we call parables. So what's a parable? Well, I suppose uh, a theological definition of a parable is something like this. A parable is a fictitious or made-up story designed to teach a lesson through comparison. When you hear the story, you can relate it to your own life. It is like an illustration for the points in a sermon. It conveys its message of truth through analog, through comparison or contrast. Now, Bible theologians sort of dispute how many parables in the Bible there are. They even dispute some text in the Bible about whether they're a parable or not. But whatever, we know two things. One, that parables Jesus taught were quite outstanding and memorable. And secondly, he was a great storyteller. And it's amazing, isn't it? We like stories and they, we remember them. I was just thinking about this. And I don't think I've read the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears for possibly over 50 years. But I bet you I could tell it. Why? Because it's memorable. And I'm sure that there are lots of parables, if you were challenged, you could repeat because they're memorable. There's a few other things that are about parables. The English dictionary says, a simple story used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. I was always taught in my early days when I became a Christian that a parable was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Why are we struggling today? But a parable is literally something cast alongside something else. Jesus' parables were stories that were cast alongside a truth in order to illustrate that true. So the parables of Jesus. And in many ways, when we look at parables, we need to understand something about them, otherwise we would always miss the point. Lots of times, people listen to Jesus' parables and they say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus said to them, that's because you don't really want to understand the truth about the kingdom of God. So we need to get in a way to understand and I think put ourselves into parables. And, uh, you know, because there's lots of them. We could say there's between 40 and 65 parables in the Bible, depending on how you'd like to, to count them. But the most important thing about parables is we must read them within the context of the cultural situation that Jesus spoke in. Otherwise, we're never going to get the hang of them. Now, and Jesus, in his story, used to exaggerate. Remember when he told the parable of the servant who had run up a debt of 10,000 talents. And we obviously don't know what a talent is these days. It's not a measure of money, 
that we use or are ever likely to use. Yes, yeah, so we've got this parable, these 10,000 talents. Well, Jesus, the story, if we read it into a modern context, would be this servant owed about 10 billion pounds. Well, that's a lot of money, and the story gathers that. But in reality, no one in Palestine or in Israel at the time of Jesus spoke that parable would have owned anything near that amount. That was just totally up. There wouldn't have been that much money in the world. Do you understand me? So we, we've got to try and understand them. So, and they change, they want to change our thinking. And they ask us to pass judgment on what Jesus is referring to in a parable. We take the parable of the Good Samaritan, which I'll take that most of us would know. You know, the parable of the Samaritan who picked up this poor man that had been robbed on the road to Jericho. And we're asked to judge the Samaritan against the two Israelite priests that walked by on the other side. So these are all contexts of parables for our understanding of it. And so we come into this, we're going to look at this, the good shepherd. Well, shepherds have a special understanding in parables. Shepherds at this time in Israel were important people. The elite didn't like shepherds. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the temple leaders thought they were dirty people. Why? Because sheep were used to sacrifice, to be sacrificed, and there was a lot of blood about. And in Jewish culture at that time, if you contaminated yourself with blood, you wasn't unf you was unfit to worship God. And so virtually shepherds were excluded from worshipping with their fellow believers. And this was a misnomer because deep within the teaching of the scriptures we see that God was to be seen, God the Father that is, to be seen as a good shepherd, someone who led their people. Why? Because as Chris said earlier, shepherds at that time led the sheep, they didn't drive them. So the other thing we, we need to understand is that shepherds and sheep have got this special understanding in Jewish history and theology. Sheep were an important part of the economy of Israel. They provided milk and meat and of course wool, which was essential for them. And uh, so they were important people. Shepherds were important people, although they were shoved aside by the ruling authorities. But for the ordinary man and woman, shepherds were special people and needy people and looked up to because they played their part in everyday life of the Jewish society. And God had said that Israel's leaders should be like Shepherds, good shepherds. And yet when the time of Jesus had come along, the leaders of the Jews were anything but good shepherds. So the parable of the good shepherd, and it's quite a long parable as parables go. Quite different because parables can be very quick. So there's a lot in this. But as we go through it, we need to remember this with this particular parable. The parables of Jesus must be understood within the context of first century 
Palestine. And that's the thing we must, yeah, in a way, we must put aside all our ideas and all the things we see with our eyes when we talk about sheep, about English sheep and Western European sheep, you know, standing in green fields, lovely white fur, wool, you know, looking very healthy uh, and fat. Or, you know, if we move up to the north of England, into the Welsh Hills or the Lake District, we see all these one flocks, very agile sheep running around in green surroundings. This is Palestine, all right? This is Israel. This is where shepherds operate. When I went there quite a few years ago now, and we was in and around Bethlehem, I was dying to take some photographs of some sheep at Bethlehem, you know. And I was gobsmacked because this is the terrain of the, around Bethlehem in southern Judea. And I eventually caught up with sheep. And to be honest, they look more like goats than sheep. And, you know, where's the grass? And of course the truth is, there isn't any. You look around, they're eating uh, coarse bushes and hedges and leaves of little trees and shrubs and all that. And they're, these, these food things are vastly scattered throughout. Jerusalem, and the shepherds were young. You know, they were teenage boys. Never saw really any old men when we eventually found the sheep. And they were all colours, bit shh, you know, not very fat, and the wool very tangled and everything else. Well, this is what Jesus was talking about when he was referring to sheep and shepherds. This is what the people would understand. Nothing like our shepherds at all. But one thing in common is the shepherd led the sheep and the shepherd knew the sheep by name. And the sheep learned and grew up to trust the shepherd because without the shepherd, it's doubtful that they'd ever survive. Because, strangely enough, sheep are not that much intelligent. And they've got no means of defending themselves. Lots of wild animals defend themselves because they're speedy, aren't they? And they can run away from animals or run into holes or anything. Well, sheep can't do anything about it. So sheep learn to be dependent on the shepherd and recognise his voice and often these shepherds would gather together and so at the end of the day or when they went their different ways the shepherd would call the sheep and shout and some of them would play flutes and whistles and that sort of thing and the sheep would separate so this is what Jesus is talking about during the 1980s, when there was a lot of uh, discomfort in Palestine with the uprising, the Israeli army decided to punish a village near Bethlehem for not paying its taxes to the Jewish authorities. So the army rounded up all the sheep they could, tens of thousands of them, and of course that made the situation worse. But one Arab widow challenged the Israeli army and demanded that they got no right to take her sheep because she was a widow. It was her only means of support. And she demanded her sheep back. And the Israeli commander said, well, I suppose he felt a bit sorry for being challenged in such a way. And he said, well, how are you going to sort your sheep out from this lot? And she said, simple. 
and she started calling their names and out of this big herd of sheep, all her sheep came forward and she got all her 25 sheep and walked off of them. That's the sort of way that shepherds looked after their sheep and the sheep knew them and they could be separated. Sheep, they used to gather the sheep at night into these sheepfolds. Now this is quite a rigid picture of a sheepfold. Sometimes they were round, rough stones. I mean this is strange enough. I have struggled to find a bit of a different picture of a sheepfold. But you get the idea. Stones gathered round one gate and the shepherd stood in it and the idea was that he could keep the wild animals at bay. And Jesus used this illustration of the gate to make another strong point when he told this parable. The first five verses of this story pointed out, Jesus wanted to point out that he was the true Messiah, the true king of God's people. Because he said that he stood in that gate and it was he who let people in and he kept the bad things out, wolves and bears and other sort of things. It showed that Jesus, as the true shepherd, would be the one who would take care of his people. He would know his people by name. And so he was referring to himself and taking that place that the Israelis, the Jewish people knew as the Jewish true king and the true God because he was coming as the new good shepherd to take over the running of God's kingdom here on earth. And there's lots of allusions in the Old Testament to this. Here's one from Psalm 121. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. Jesus would keep us safe. In contrast to the thieves of the world who would never be able to get in through the good shepherd. The good shepherd would protect his sheep. And he illustrates that by saying that, you know, shepherds who are hired to look after sheep would never really protect the sheep if they was in danger from animals or thieves because the sheep weren't their own. Jesus is a tree shepherd and his people are his own so he will look after them. Jesus the true shepherd. Israel have been troubled for years about the shepherds of the people not really looking after their people. We see this in the prophets. This is from Ezekiel 34. The Lord said, Ezekiel, son of man, Israel's leaders are like shepherds taking care of my sheep, the people of Israel. But I want you to condemn these leaders and tell them, I, the Lord God, say, you shepherds of Israel are doomed. You take care of yourselves while ignoring my sheep. You drink their milk and use their wool to make your clothes. Then you butcher the best ones for food but you don't take care of the flock. You have never protected the weak ones or healed the sick ones or bandaged those who get hurt. You let them wander off and never took, looked for those who get lost. You are cruel and mean to my sheep. They strayed in every direction and because there was no shepherd to watch over them, they were attacked and eaten by wild animals. So my sheep were scattered across the earth. They roamed on hills and mountains without anyone ever bothering to look for them. 
So Jesus was reignited the condemnation of Israel's leaders in the same way that the prophets had before them. And the prophets had highlighted Israel's leaders as being bad shepherds and criticised them, but they never sought to change their ways. Israel's leaders, from the days of the end of the kings, became bad leaders. So Jesus comes into this situation in his mission and stands out in front of the leaders of Israel and says, I am the good shepherd. And he's trying to emphasise that he's come as God comes to look after the people. And he will be the good shepherd and protect them. And of course, as we said, the people of Israel didn't understand this parable because they were the bad shepherds themselves. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. Another reference to the poor leadership of Israel from the prophet Isaiah. The other interesting thing about this parable is that Jesus speaks of other sheep, not of his fold, which is quite outstanding, isn't it? Jesus says, other sheep, not of my fold, are also my concern. He establishes that not only will God's own people, Israel, be looked after by their shepherd, their true shepherd, but others will as well, outside God's chosen people. The rest of the world becomes his chosen people, those who want to look and follow Jesus will come into his fold, will come into his care. So that's how we are included in this. The fact that people were hearing him and following him meant that Jesus was being recognised in many quarters about being the good shepherd. And that's what he's announcing. But of course, just before this event, we see that Jesus healed a blind man and the Pharisees challenged Jesus on this because it was on the Sabbath again and Jesus saying, you know, I've come to care for those, the poor, the sick. You are not caring for them. You know, you don't, you're as blind as that man I just healed. And of course the other thing that puts Jesus apart, apart from every other shepherd is the shepherd's sacrifice. He is the unique shepherd who is prepared undoubtedly, totally, to lay down his life for his sheep. Jesus makes this astounding statement in these verses, in this parable, this type of story to reiterate that he has come to save everybody. He is the one who will lay down his life so that everybody can know the true love of God and be accepted into God's kingdom. So this parable is still relevant to us today. Because when we look upon Easter time and Jesus' sacrifice, not only is Jesus sacrificed, he's sacrificed as the good shepherd, the lamb of God, the official way we look at Jesus now is through the lamb of God. So we are all like sheep, have gone astray, each 
of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So this is that, going back to Isaiah again, that this great metaphor of the good shepherd links in the metaphor of the sacrificing servant of back of Isaiah. The good shepherd alone was sinless, was uniquely qualified to bear the sins of others and all people. Like sheep, stupid and helpless, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus takes on the sacrificial part of the sheep in this story of the Good Shepherd. So it's quite a wonderful story, isn't it? The Good Shepherd, it's one of those I'm sure we recognise. It's a wonderful thing. We often hear Psalm 23, isn't it? It's one of the most popular pieces of scripture today. And even people who don't fully understand that words of the psalm, talks about the Lord, the God, being the good shepherd in the words of Psalm 23, how he leads us through dark places, leads us on to good pasture. This is all part of the content of this one little story in John's Gospel. It's only John's Gospel that mentions the good shepherd. And I can imagine John who wrote his gospel after the others, knew the importance of putting it in the scriptures for us. So, pastoral literature is one of the most important conventions of literature at every stage of its history. It is also important in the Bible, where the focus is less on lush landscape as an image of pleasure and escape from burdensome reality and more on the functions performed by a shepherd on behalf of the sheep. Rooted in the sheep-shepherd relationship, the biblical imagery stresses the care and compassion of the divine shepherd and the dependence of the people of God to meet all their needs. Do you see it? Do you see how God wants to relate to us as a shepherd, a true good shepherd would to his sheep in the times of Jesus. One of those stories, great story, that we need to look at in context of history, but we can bring into our own understanding and know Jesus is still the good shepherd for us who would look after us through all difficult times and make sure his sheep will be well fed, well cared for and protected forever. Next week we look at I am the vine.